Okay. Hi, IST652. Um, I wanted to make sure that you still have an opportunity to learn the material that we missed on Monday. So this is me recording the lecture that I had planned on introducing to you all. Um, just as a quick update, I did want to share with you that I do have a happy and healthy daughter. Uh, I can show you pictures. They are right here. Her name is Isla Shea Nichols. She was born six pounds, 10 ounces on February 6th, 2020 at 11 p.m. in the city of Syracuse. She is really good at crying and pretty good at sleeping. So definitely completely new for me. So it's a big, big change in my life. Um, and thank you all for your continued support and uh, flexibility in, in scheduling around the class. So thank you all. Okay, so with regards to what we're covering today, um, we're going to explore a few new Python data types. These will be integral as we develop more sophisticated uh, modeling techniques using things like pandas and numpy. But for now, um, the two new data structures that we're going to introduce are tuples, which are very similar to lists, um, but are used in different uh, scenarios, and dictionaries. Dictionaries you can think of as um, data collections for which you can, you can retrieve information. Instead of using uh, integer or numeric indices or indexes, you can actually access uh, indexes that you've encoded yourself. So they can be um, indexed by a list. They can be indexed by a string. Um, there are certain rules about what you can index by. In other programming languages, dictionaries are also called hash tables. Uh, and it has to do with the way that that data is stored on the machine. So as we go through, um, obviously you won't have an opportunity to ask any questions. Um, however, I'd be happy to re uh, answer any questions over email or uh, same goes for, for Srina. So if you send us both emails, we'll do our best to, to tackle those as they come up. Okay. So as we're going along, um, like I mentioned, we're going to be focusing on tuples and dictionaries with tuples to start. So what's important to know about tuples are that they are very much like lists in that you have a sequenced uh, items in a, a sequenced set of items in a collection. So you can access elements of a tuple just like you would a list. So you can access via the integer index or via slicing as we've covered. However, what's different about a, a, a tuple versus a list is that a tuple generally isn't meant to be used for very large collections as well as the fact that it's, a, it's called an immutable data structure. And an immutable data structure is one in which the elements do not change. So once you've set the elements of a tuple, they are not to be changed, overwritten, deleted, or added to. So it's really useful uh, if you want a piece of reference information that you know will not change and cannot be corrupted. So for instance, when we work with lists, we are instantiating them, looping through different programs, appending, deleting, manipulating. That's perfectly fine. That's, that's great for lists. But if you want a data set that you are positive that will not change over time, tuples will be the better option. Additionally, um, we're going to quickly look through the differences of tuples versus lists in action. So to create a tuple, there are two ways. Uh, first of all, like lists, they have a unique character which assigns uh, elements within them. So for a tuple, you would use a, um, a traditional parenthesis here. So you'll see a, a parenthesis, uh, two fruits. We have an acai and cherry, and they're set to the fruit tuple variable. Oh, my goodness, pardon me. Okay, you'll see that the type is tuple. Additionally, you can also do the following. You can set them to be as an input to the function tuple. Ah, you cannot. But what you can do is you can actually pass a list and convert it to a tuple. So this is fine. So these two outcomes are identical. So within a traditional parenthesis or a list passed into the tuple uh, data type conversion operator. Okay. Additionally, we can then look at the length, the length of the tuple or the length of the tuple. This is the same function that we've used for lists. And additionally, we can access the first element of the tuple 
using the integer indexing. The same can also be said by slicing. So to demonstrate that here, we can say from zero to two, oh, and you'll get acai and cherry, the, the two elements within the tuple, okay? Now to demonstrate tuple immutability, we're gonna take a look at tuple assignment. So just like if you had a list, if you wanted to, to overwrite or reset the value that exists in the uh, index location for number one, you could do the following. You'd say uh, fruit list one is equal to orange. However, if it's a tuple, this object is not a port, that does not support item assignment. So trying to set a value to be uh, equal to a location within the tuple is not allowed. The same can be said for trying to delete an item from a tuple. This again is another operation which is not allowed for tuples. Finally, unlike lists, tuples cannot, uh, you cannot append values to a tuple. Now what we can see here is if we do the same operations for lists, they are all functional. So the chief understanding or the chief uh, thing I would like you all to take away from lists versus tuples are that lists are mutable or changeable. You can add, delete, manipulate elements within a list. However, tuples are not. Once you've set the values within a tuple, the only way to change them uh, are to create a new tuple. Okay, now moving on to dictionaries. Like I mentioned earlier, dictionaries are another Python core data structure. And I say core because it's it's something that Python supports natively right out of the box. We're going to cover later this semester uh, new data structures like um, pandas data frames and pandas series or numpy arrays. These are not supported out of the box. Um, so dictionaries are in a supported data structure. And what a dictionary is, is a, um, it is a collection of key value pairs. Now the key is also the same value for which you would access the, the, the value from the dictionary using um, indexing. So it would be something like dictionary, square brackets, name of key to access that value. Additionally, um, dictionaries are not indexed by zero to n minus one. They are instead indexed by those keys. What this really means is that dictionaries cannot be reliably considered ordered or sequential. And to learn more, you can access the Python docs here um, for more information regarding dictionaries. So there are two ways to instantiate a dictionary. Either you can use the uh, dict, open, close, paren, will create an empty dictionary, like so. Or you can use curly braces. These curly braces will, will also instantiate a dictionary. And here we can validate that these two dictionaries are the same from either method. This is just simply the um, equivalence operator. All right, so creating a dictionary between the key and the value, you'll notice that there is a semicolon. This is the separator between key and value pairs for a single dictionary element. An element is composed of a key and a value. Multiple elements are separated by commas, and the entire dic dictionary is wrapped within curly curly braces. All right. Now notice, just like lists and tuples, I can access the length of the dictionary by, by passing uh, or by operating the len function. And notice here I have the len of three, Eric, John, and Michael. Okay. Similarly, I can print the elements of the list. Now, if I actually wanted to access, I want to make sure that I have an example of how to access an element of a list. I do, it's down there, so I won't jump forward. Now, I actually found this really interesting. With the latest release of the core Python programming language, and specifically the implementation called CPython, um, and by the way, CPython simply refers to the Python version which compiles to the C programming language. So within the latest version of Python, which is Python 3.7, dictionaries are now ordered. In the past, before Python 3.7, you could not guarantee that there is uh, order integrity or insert order integrity with respect to elements in a dictionary. What that means is when you create the dictionary, you may have 
one, two, three orders, just like the way that we have them here, Eric, John, and Michael, order one, two, and three. In the future, if you wanted to print that dictionary, Python could not guarantee that you would get them in the same order that you added them. However, starting with 3.7 going forward, this order is, is now guaranteed and you can depend on it. However, I cannot speak to the instance of Python that you all have on your machines. So it's integral here to know which version of Python, whether or not you can assume this order is um, dependable. Now, ideally, you don't actually incorporate this new piece of information into your coding paradigm. And in fact, you still presume that order is, is, is not something to be relied on. That way, any of the code can be transferred between uh, 3.7 and prior to. 3.7. Okay. Now, uh, dictionaries have two built-in methods. If you'll recall, a method is just a particular function applied to an object. And here, the two methods are accessing a list of the keys from the dictionary. So the keys, again, are the value uh, before the colon. So here, then we have Eric, John, and Michael. Additionally, you can cast the return object, which is the dictionary keys, to a list. So now I have the list of keys, Eric, John, and Michael. And the same can be done for values. So we have keys and values. And that, again, can also be converted not only just to a list, but also to a tuple. Now, you can con similarly convert the keys also to a tuple. There's nothing that, oh, there's nothing that prevents you from doing so. But I simply wanted to demonstrate I can type properly, that tuples and list both operate this way. Now, if that's still not enough for you, if you need more than just the, the values and the keys, you can also return the items, which is a tupled pair of keys and values. So now you have a list of tuples where the first element is a tuple composed of uh, the zero index element being the key and the one index element being the phone number. Now, to actually request information from a dictionary, instead of accessing using numeric integers like we have for tuples and lists, you're actually going to pass in keys. So here, if you want the phone number for Eric, you'll need to pass Eric into the indexed value for the phone day. So here, we can access Eric, John, and Michael's phone numbers by passing Eric, John, and Michael as the uh, index lookup value for phone dict. But you will get an error if a particular key does not exist in the dictionary. So here we're trying to look up Chris. Chris does not already exist in the phone dict. And you can see that as follows. So if I do print phone dict, I should be able to spell at this point. You'll notice that Chris does not exist. So if you actually try to access the key Chris, you're going to get a key error. Key error, Chris. Chris does not exist in this dictionary. So what do we do? Well, there's a couple of options. Uh, first of all, you can always first check to see if Chris does exist in the phone dict using the in conditional operator. Conditional operator, as you recall, also return Booleans, true or false. So you'll see that Eric does exist in the phone dict, while Chris does not exist. So false and true. Okay. Now again, you cannot find Chris. However, a second way to access data from a dictionary, instead of simply passing Chris the index lookup value, you can actually use another method called dot get and Chris. Now here again, Chris still does not exist in the dictionary, but using the dot get method will first determine does Chris exist and if so, return a value. And here, Chris does not exist, so the get function simply returns nothing no operation or, or it simply returns because get is a method and the method simply returns nothing at all. Now what's nice about get though is that alternatively instead of actually returning uh, nothing by default you could put a, an optional argument to the get method and here I want to say if Chris does not exist print the value does not exist or return the value I should say return the value does not exist. So we look up Chris, Chris does not exist and this is compared to, let's say, Eric, who does exist, and you simply get the phone number. Does not exist will not be passed because Eric already exists in the phone dict. 
Okay. Additionally, if we wanted to add Chris to the to the um, to the dictionary, assignment is as simple as uh, creating Chris the key passed in square brackets like you would look up an index to the phone dict and then pass the phone value. So notice here we have the key and the value using the set operation. Okay. Okay. Great. So these values have now been added to the phone dict and the same code that we ran earlier to look up Chris. And this is what we get. Okay. So iterating over a dictionary. So for values in the dictionary, you can actually, um, first of all, by default, it's going to return the keys when you iterate over a dictionary. But you can also enforce that you actually, uh, it, it's a better practice to do um, return the keys just so that there's no ambiguity when someone is reading the code, whether or not you're going to get keys or values. If you explicitly indicate keys, you'll obviously get keys. And here's a way to loop over returning the keys and the value by using the key to actually look up the associated value from the phone dict. However, this is somewhat inefficient since, as you recall, you can actually return the items, which is both the key and the value from the phone dict. And like we talked about last week's lecture, you have multi-value assignment. So when you iterate over both the keys and the values, you get both at the same time. So for key and value, which are temporary iterable variables from the return objects phone dict items, which looks, as, looks like this, if you'll recall. So for each one of these tupled items, print both the key and the value. So Eric, phone number, John, phone number, Chris, phone number, Michael, phone number. Okay. So we're going to create another dictionary. So this is just a simple dictionary that counts the number of words. Okay. So if you want to sort a dictionary, how would one do that? Obviously, if, if we were in class, you'd be able to answer that question. But let's kind of break down this little piece of information here. So first of all, let's go inside out. So we, as you'll recall, we have here a list comprehension. Okay, the list comprehension simply says, create a list from the element. Uh, actually, let's go one step backwards. First of all, we have the uh, count dict items, which returns, I really should keep continuing to go backwards. All right, so as you'll recall, when you take the items method from the count dict, you get an iterable called dict items, which is a, uh, a list of tuples. Now, you can convert that list of tuples strictly to a list, instead of it being a dict item, you can convert it directly to a list. And then what we're going to do is we're going to convert the tuples themselves into lists. So uh, the reason that we want to do that is that we can actually operate the sorted uh, program, the sorted function on lists. You cannot operate the sorted function on uh, tuples. So what we want to do is once we have this now new list of lists, instead of list of tuples, we finally want to sort by the first element. Beautiful dog, Manda. Now, if you instead wanted to sort by the values instead of the keys, you would change it from one, zero to one. So now we have three, six, eight, sixty. And now if you also finally recall, um, there is something called reverse equals, my phone number, reverse equals true, it will return it in descending order because this is an optional argument to the sorted function. So this was just a little kind of a hacky way to return uh, these sorted values from a dictionary. Okay, so this is just a quick introduction to both tuples and dictionaries. 
This information is also available in the online reading, um, uh, which was provided to you all last week in the, in the exit slides. Um, so if you need any help finding that, just obviously reach out to Street Author. Okay. Next, we're going to use, we're going to start to look at uh, another package uh, or library in Python called the Python CSV reader. Uh, I think I've mentioned this in the past, but CSVs are simply uh, data files and it's a specific file format called comma separated values. Now, CSV is sort of also just a general term for any delimited value in a um, non-proprietary programming way, like in a Microsoft Excel or a Apple uh, Numbers file. So CSV um, is also, for me, somewhat interchangeable with a .tsv, which is, instead of comma-separated values, is tab-separated values. So what we want to do here is we actually want to do um, uh, ingesting a set of rows and columns into a dictionary of values. That's really what we, we want to do. So we're going to look at this, this uh, file, which has information um, by state. So specifically, we have the state name, the state abbreviation, the postal abbreviation. I'm sorry, that is the, that's the state abbreviation. Um, we have the area in square miles, and we also have the population of that state. And this was, I believe, circa 2013. So what we want to do is we want to actually uh, do the following. First, we want to fetch the file states, uh, states data. Then we want to actually load data into the empty rows. Um, I'm sorry, we want to load the data into an empty list. And we want to make sure that we actually remove any blank lines or, I don't know, a messy data. That's sort of the goal. So you'll see at the bottom we have blank lines. Um, we also have this uh, sort of end of file, this, this 1990 census. So I'm sorry, it was on 2013, 1990. Okay. So here is a big block of code that I'll, all, I'll let all of you take a look at um, on your own. This will be available in the Jupyter Notebooks uploaded to Blackboard. But what's going to be key here is that it's going to return an error. And the reason is it's because there's messy data. So it's going to attempt to read through line by line using the import CSV module. And you'll see that here. It's going to try to convert this into a CSV object. And then from there, we're going to try to create values for this, this state dictionary that we're going to um, uh, create. So what we, what we want to end up with, uh, what we want to end up with is a list of dictionaries where each dictionary represents a state. So here we instantiate the list, we iterate over lines in the files, and then we create a dictionary object and append that dictionary object to the list. But Unfortunately, at this time, we failed to do so because of the fact that we have um, issues with the file. And this is sort of what it looks like when we use um, just the, the CSV. And you'll notice that there still are a lot of uh, blank lines and uh, the data itself is still fairly messy. So we, we need to clean it up. Notice the quotes and, and things like that. And one of the reasons why this is failing is that the data itself actually has commas in them. So uh, in traditional uh, I don't know, number articulation, there are comma separations between the hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions. But Python is not going to handle that very nicely. Instead, you actually need to remove the commas in order to uh, ensure that the fields are properly uh, numericized. So here we have the area and the population as two data points in state, which we try to cast as integers. Um, and in fact, we, we, we are successful by removing the commas and, and replacing them with nothing. So this is just an, a blank string. So empty string. From there, we actually will be able to convert something that has commas into a Python integer value. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be an integer. It's also have been a float, but the same logic applies. This will fail because of the commas. Could not convert string to float. This is considered a string because it has the, uh, 
comments. So how do we handle problems where uh, our, our code is, is throwing errors? Maybe we have messy data. Maybe there are end of line file, uh, end of file lines. Maybe there are lines that we don't want to consider, but we don't have the time to clean them all out because there are thousands of them. Python allows for something called try and accept logic, which means that you can write a piece of code that will attempt to function in some particular way, but if it fails, you can just error handle, or you can tell Python to do something if that code that you've written fails. So it's really helpful to incorporate try and accept logic into your day-to-day -day coding so that you have something that's a little bit more robust and fault intolerant, which means that if there is an error in the code, um, you, won't, you won't break your pipeline or you won't break your code uh, on a recurrent basis. Okay, so how do we encode something so that things are uh, encountering, encountering or, 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 or facilitating non-error-free data. So an example might be, maybe we see this value, this 4,599,S. So S was actually meant to stand for a five, for instance, but there was a typo. How could we ever handle that? Well, perhaps if this is a data point that we, we don't necessarily need to include or we're, we're comfortable excluding it, then we simply write a try and accept block, which will allow us to ignore it for all intents and purposes. So what's important here is when you see an error, errors themselves have error types. The specific error type here is called a value error. Earlier in this lecture, we saw something called a key error when we attempted to access a data point in a dictionary using the, um, the key. So the key error indicated that the, 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 the data point did not exist in that dictionary. So here, if we attempt to replace the commas with uh, single values and cast as an int for the number string. Here is the number string. It will fail. However, within our try and accept block, if it fails, if it fails, then what we can do is we can actually print error. Okay, so we have a quick exercise to handle bad user inputs. So I think we looked at this a couple lectures ago, but we want to take in integers and return all of the even integers between um, zero and that number. So I entered the number 10, we get two, four, six, and eight. Perhaps we type 20. We get two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. What if I type something that's not a number? If I type in something, let's say lollipop, I get an error. Specifically, I get a value error. The value error indicates I cannot cast lollipop as an integer. Can't do it. So we need a way to actually handle bad user input. So first of all, we always just want to just start with a try. Try to do the thing that we want to do. Here we want to return all of those, um, those elements for which we inserted into our list. But if we fail to do so, we accept it. Now accept requires that you indicate the particular uh, exception that occurs, and here it's a value error. And then we need to simply indicate what we want Python to do. Here I'll say bad user input. Okay, and now let's try it again. So first it's going to try. Still works just as it always did, but now let's do Lollipop. Ah, so let's see. Okay, well I, ah, I see. So I made the mistake and you actually need to put the try before casting as an integer. So this was a good example of me not quite understanding what I needed to do. Okay. Great. So bad user input. And let's also bring the print statements within the try block as well. Because you don't want to print unnecessary information that's less pertinent to the example. So 
bad user input. And that's the end of my block. So now using try and accept, I can handle without breaking my code. And by breaking, I mean throwing an exception. Um, I can now handle all different types of user input, even if they're not what the code was asking for. Right. Now, as you recall, this particular code block was failing. So instead, what I want to do is I actually want to wrap some try and accept logic. And specifically, it's having a hard time with area. Now, even if I remove this block of code, I'm still going to get another area uh, uh, issue on population. And it has to do with the fact that I'm trying to cast things as, as integers. Interesting. Uh, let's see. Yes. So uh, among many things, this is not the best approach. Instead, we should try and use tr uh, we should use try and accept logic. So here, first of all, we want to actually still persist any lines that don't have errors because otherwise this, this program will, will not make sense. So you don't want to wrap the entire code and try and accept. Instead, you want to actually try and accept each line. So you're going to try and accept within the iteration. So here, try to do all the things that you want to do on each line. And if you fail, then pass a value, uh, uh, pass an error. So here, print, I don't know, uh, bad line. And I'm actually going to print the line itself. Okay, bad line. It was trying to cast these empty strings as, as integers. So we actually overcome and resolve that problem. Okay, so that's a little bit about try and accept. Um, take a break, uh, do what you have to do, and uh, Stay tuned for the second half of the lecture, which will be covering the following. Data summarization, uh, numeric fields, average mins and maxes. All right, thank you all.